For all of us, it's about predicting where the consumer is going and getting half of it right. One of the things we want to do is create ads that don't suck. Embracing change creates great possibility. I'm Alan Hart, and this is Marketing Today. Today on the show, I've got John Evans. He's a chief customer officer at System One Group. And for the past 25 years before joining them, he was a client-side CMO working on large brands that we'll talk about, like LucasAid in the UK. He is now currently a chief customer officer at System One. Previously, he was the CMO. He's also the host of the Uncensored CMO podcast. We spend a good bit of time talking about System One, what they do, how they drive insights for marketers on the brand side and what works in advertising today. We also talk a little bit about the role of CMO and what people, misconceptions, I think, from people in terms of what CMOs really do every day and much more. So I hope you enjoy this conversation with John Evans. John, welcome to the show. Great to be here, Alan. It's a, it's a pleasure and an honor to join you. <laughs> well, I'm excited for this conversation. One podcaster talking to another. <laughs> I know. What could go wrong, eh? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. So um, I hear you You had a challenge to put energy back into the number one energy drink in the UK. I really want to hear what that's about. Oh, I love how most people are famous for doing something well, and I seem to be famous for getting something wrong. But anyway... <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot we can learn in failure, isn't there? Most people listening, I'm sure, will have come across the the classic Coke debacle in the 80s. I mean, do you remember mm. the you know when Coke tries to change their formulation and uh, got enormous backlash? Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> that, that that ended badly, didn't it? Well, I probably have the award for trying to repeat it and getting the same <laughs> result. <laughs> the um, I tell you what happened though, because uh, I, I was running Lucas Aid, it's called in 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 the UK, which is. I guess for anyone in America listening, it's the equivalent of Gatorade. So it's mm. the most common energy drink and sports drink. There are two versions of it. And in the UK back in, this is 2017, I think, maybe 2018, we had a sugar tax come out from the UK mm. government. And it was awful because like, we had to reformulate to reduce the sugar. So we had no choice, basically. And um, despite my best attempts to reformulate without anyone noticing, um, <laughs> they did notice. And uh, it was one of those things, and this is a real lesson for marketers, the perception of change was much more damaging than the reality of change. So even though in taste tests, the formulation was a match and was liked as much as the previous one, it was actually the fact that people heard that it had changed. And so even if it tasted as good, when people tried it, because they were primed because of social media backlash to uh, notice the difference, and we actually did a study to look into whether people had stopped buying it because they, it, they actually didn't like it or they stopped buying because they heard it had changed. And the majority of people that stopped buying weren't stopped buying because they said it, was, it wasn't any good. It was because we had changed, we had taken away what they know and love. And, and this, in fact, was exactly the response that uh, Coke had. And there was a big study into it that it was called the, the wrong question I think it was called where when Coke, it was a, it was, it, yeah, I need to try and remember it. But when Coke reformulated, they asked people, do you prefer the new formula to the old one? And mm. on average, more people like the new than the old. But the, it was the wrong question. The question should be, how would you feel if we took away a product you know and love? And that really was the question that we should have asked. So we fell into a similar trap, basically, by assuming that we could match it. Now, of course, the difference between us and Coke is, we were responding to government legislation. And so we were forced to make the change as opposed to Coke, who I think chose to make the change. Right, right. Wow. I mean, that, that's uh, quite the story. How did you get back on the, back on the right track? <laughs> well, well, that's a very good question. It was, um, it was probably one of the hardest years I've had as a, as a marketer because uh, to give you the data, give you an example of how challenging it was, we, we lost 20% of our brand volume in 12 weeks. So, and, and this is a product that's consumed by millions. It's, uh, as I say, number one energy drink. It's hugely well-known, 85-year history. And what we decided to do was basically relaunch the whole brand. So new positioning, new advertising. We undertook actually the UK's biggest ever sampling campaign. So we sampled <laughs> over 10 million people. Now, I know that might not sound much in America. 10 million people is like one in six people. 
you know, in the UK. <laughs> I mean, like you couldn't Everybody avoid it. Everybody gets one. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Well, do you know, it's, it's one of those funny things. This is a lesson actually as well. We had a reasonably decent marketing budget. And you mm. know when you sit down and go, what do we need to do? Well, what we need to do is prove to people that it tastes as good as the previous one. And we worked out that we could afford actually to give everybody in the whole country a free bottle. <laughs> yeah, you know, our budget our budget was big enough to do that, and it's just it, you know it's just one of those things where you think you know let's go back from what we're trying to do and work, how do we put our resources behind it anyway. So, but what we did in the end is we had the biggest ever sampling campaign, we had the biggest advertising campaign the brands ever ever engaged in, we had the biggest in store activity. You know, you know where you send people into stores and they build massive displays, you know, on the end of the aisle and that mm. kind of thing. We were doing all that. So it took the whole company 12 months of, of absolute dedication, focus, our best marketing we could throw at it. And we recovered the lost volume. It took just over a year to recover our position wow. to what yeah. we'd lost. Yeah. But it was a year of, it's, it's a weird feeling, right? When you do so much work and spend so much money and you end up getting yourself back to where you were. That's a bit of a, <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> yes. But it, it's a story. It, it's also a story of um, how how habitual consumers can be and what they like and what they don't like. <laughs> I, totally. I know. Yeah. And they don't like change. And then this, no. this, this going back yeah. to my the wrong question, it, right. it, it was a question of how people feel about change, not mm. what they think about a product. It, it's an interesting mm. distinction, but that was the massive learning, actually. We, we had to manage. We had to manage perception more than manage reality, if you know what I mean, in terms of, yeah, you know, yeah. reassuring people that, in fact, the campaign we did was, was, I think, one of my most favorite campaigns I've ever done. And it was called Energy Beats Everything. And we, what we did is we went back <laughs> to the original story of the brand, which was about people recovering from difficult situations and using energy to conquer quite challenging circumstances. And so we went back to that. And actually, that was a brilliant source of inspiration. And, and, and it really helped us, you know, navigate the brand back onto track. Mm, I love it. I love it. Well, um, let's, I want to get to know you a little bit more and, and your pathway to where you are now. You, now, I think when we first talked, you were a CMO and now you're chief customer officer at System One Group. So we know you were in the energy drink business, but tell us a little bit more about your path to uh, System One. Yeah. Well, I've spent about 25 years as a client side marketer, I, actually all of it in drinks of some kind, either either soft drinks or alcoholic drinks. So yeah, I know how to make a drink, shall we say. <laughs> you know, so <laughs> there you go. If you need to know, I can tell you. But anyway, so I've had a wonderful, uh, wonderful career, thoroughly enjoyed it. I've worked on big brands, I've worked on small brands, and I've worked in sales and in marketing and, and done that. So uh, thoroughly enjoyed it. I had a bit of a shocking year, actually. So it may not surprise you or the listeners to know that I did end up getting fired after that year, which is a bit, um, a bit gutting for me because having, I think having worked so hard to get the brand back, you know, <laughs> right. then, then to get fired anyway was a bit, you know, just when I thought I'd done the job that I needed to. Um, <laughs> but unfortunately, I think the decision had been made many, many months before. And then I, I got my dream job. I, I ended up working for BrewDog, a, a brand that I really oh, admire. Yeah. I mean, what a, I mean, talk about a brand that in a 10 year time frame has just come out of nowhere to transform the beer market in astonishing ways. But I, I, and look, I knew it was a high risk thing to do, but I spent three months at BrewDog and in the end decided that it wasn't going to be the right, place. even though I did enjoy it, mm. there, I, I found I wasn't able to, I suppose, I mean, the, the way I phrased it when I got interviewed after us about it, it was maybe it was too early to be a CMO there because I, mm. I didn't have as much influence over decisions as I, I hoped I'd have right. kind of thing. And um, so I found myself mid, mid career guy, guy in his forties, this is, you know, about three or four years ago, out of a job. And, and there weren't really lots of CMO jobs out there at the time. And the marketplace was pretty challenging. So I ended up freelancing. And that was, mm. a, that was a scary thing, you know, because when you're used to getting a paycheck every month, and suddenly <laughs> every month, you've got to try and convince enough people to pay you enough money to offer them advice. But I had a lot of fun. It was only six months, but I, I got a nice portfolio of customers who, you know, who hired me for business development, for training for pitching, for you know, mm. teaching them on how to be, you know, how to be a CMO, that kind of thing. And one of the customers was a uh, was System One, and System mm. One actually had been one of my suppliers when I was so when I was working on LucasAid and when we we're doing the the energy drink relaunch. One of the challenges I got given at the time was um, 
to prove the advertising would work <laughs> before we spent the money, which is a great <laughs> question. And yeah, we're all, you know, we're all marketers listening into this. And it's like, you know, it, it's both art and science and it can never right. be fully one or the other, can it? And I thought, how on earth am I going to actually prove it? And I, I remember I'd met the founder of System One a few years earlier. And I remember him talking about how actually emotion predicts how we often behave and that they had developed these techniques of asking the right questions to find out how people respond to advertising. And you could test a script, you could test animatics. So I'd actually used them and was really impressed because it was fast, it was, it was predictive, it was useful. And so um, when I was freelancing, uh, System One ended up becoming sort of my biggest customer, as it were. And then got, you know, it just grew and grew. And eventually I, uh, I joined them. So yeah, became CMO and then more recently took over the commercial running of the company as well. So um, I'm basically in charge of all our customer relationships. I love it. I love it. Well, then what was it like to go from client side to like the agency side or the service provider side? Oh man, that is it. Oh, that, that, that is a thing, isn't it? Do you yes. know, and, and, and I don't I'm, know how many people do or have done it, but it's, yeah, I flip flopped yeah. a couple of times. It, it, it's a bizarre feeling in some respects, especially the first time. And then, but it, man, what appreciation you have now from oh. both perspectives. Oh, I know. There's got to be a book in here somewhere. But I think the first thing that I surprised me, which well, shouldn't have surprised me, but how little agencies mm -hmm. understand their customers. Mm -hmm. I, I was really surprised. I mean, in the six months I was freelancing, one of the things I used to do would, would be go along and do a, a talk on 10 things you never knew about a CMO. And, and, and for me, I spent about 40 minutes writing it. It was just like, oh, it's just this, this, and this. And actually, I was surprised at how little agencies understand of what a marketing a marketer does on the client side. So how little of their job is actually communication or, or working with agencies and how much of it is factory or supply chain or you know people. or There's so many other things you have to worry about as a, as a client side marketer that agencies don't. And it's a bit weird. It's like, um, I, mean, I suppose one analogy, it's like when you're in an agency, you see so many different verticals, don't you? You know, you spread across so many different clients. You do the same part of the marketing mix, but across many different industries. And it's completely reversed to a client side is that you basically, you're stuck in your own vertical and all you know about it for me, it was like, I know everything about soft drinks, but you're, but you're spread across different disciplines. You have to be good at finance. You have to be good at supply chain. You have to be good at innovation. You have to be good at planning. You have to be good. At, do you know what I mean? So it, yeah. it's basic. You're you're cutting. I suppose you're cutting it, it entirely differently. And the other thing as well, and, and uh, I'm sure you'll remember this, is the power balance is completely different. And you know, <laughs> particularly yes. being a CMO, right? I mean, when you're a CMO, you're really overindulged, right? Agencies are pitching you left, right, and center. You're getting invited to everything. Everyone says the, the, the thing I found is everyone says yes to you when you're a CMO. It's just like right. literally. What do you want? Yep, done. You know, and, and when you're in agencies, it's like you have to convince people to do things. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like you have to learn how to sell, I think, is probably the, probably the art to it. So that, that, was, that took me a little while, I think, to get used to. But I, I'm thoroughly enjoying it now, I should have to say. Yeah, no, it's, it, it's a fascinating experience to be on one side or the other and, and then see the other side. That notion that you meant about how little agencies understand their customers. The other thing that I've found is like they're really hesitant to just go talk to customers. <laughs> like, yes, you would think yes. it would, you think you would think it would be the opposite, but it's like, well, okay, we don't, you know, we're in a conference room, we're wrestling with this question: what What should we do? What What do we think that they want? And you know, you ask that simple question: Can we just go ask them? And, oh, and it's like, no, I, no, no, we can't. That go would ask be terrible. Them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I know. <laughs> can't do that. But well, you've reminded me just all the, the when I wrote this little course, um, ten things you never knew about the CMO. I remember presenting it. You know, to the first group, first agency, a uh, big PR agency that I was presenting to. The first thing I said to them is that the brief is never really the brief. And they're like, really? Why is that, John? And I said, well, because as a CMO, I never wrote my own briefs. It would be sort of a probably a junior brand manager wrote the brief. And the brief would be like a template, right? It would be like, who's the audience and what's the objective and what the com, you know, what's the comms got to do and, and the budget and timings and stuff. But the issue with that is not everything in that brief is equal. And what you need to do is you need to go to the customer and say, what's the actual business problem you're trying to solve? And how will you decide whether, if it, we were talking about a pitch situation, how will you make a decision about who will win the pitch? And they looked to me and said, but we'd have to go and talk to the client. And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> and they were, they, 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 was, they were going, but we don't do that because when we get the pitch, we then kind of lock ourselves in a room for two weeks yeah. and then we go and pitch. And I'm like, but you've lost the pitch. 
I said, if you, all you need to do is like, I, I, I'll give you a bit of advice. So I said, one thing, ask the CMO for 15 minutes and ask them two questions. Just the two questions, as I said, is what's the business problem you're solving for and how will you decide who wins the pitch? And those two answers then spend the two weeks reversing it, you know, your entire proposition into those two things, you know, and, uh, and I'm sure you're going to win. But it was just, it, as you just said brilliantly, it was, it was the way in which there was a fear of engaging the client. And, and what I was explaining to them in this particular case is as a client, doing a pitch is a really big deal. Like it's a big decision. It's very emotional. It's very risky. You want to, you want to end up with a partner that's going to be best than the, whoever you, you're replacing. It's a very big deal. So again, if you spend a little bit of time with the client understanding them, then it'll, it'll, it's good for them as well. You know, it'll, it'll pay off. No, I agree. I agree. Well, and along these lines, maybe we just keep talking about the CMO for a minute. Like they're, when you're in, in advertising or an ad agency and you think about the CMO, you think largely that's their job, but it's a very small part of the job, right? You, oh, you agree? Totally, <laughs> totally. Um, oh, yeah. Well, I, this, is, this is a fascinating question because you're absolutely right. And I, I even, uh, this is going to sound funny, but I even actually went and did an audit of my own time and looked at how much time do I actually <laughs> spend on advertising, right? right? And do you know what? It was 5%. And That's crazy. Yes. I told people this and they were like, really? And I said, honestly, like I don't spend every Friday brainstorming with my agency about different ideas. The CMO's job is strategy, it's people, it's finance, it's you know, budgeting, it's customer presentations, it's supply, you know, it, it's innovation. The communication it is a significant percentage of the spend, right. but a, but a quite a small percentage of the time, and a lot of it's outsourced. You know, outsourced mm -hmm. to agencies to take care of. So marketers or senior marketers are spend a lot less time on creativity and advertising than people think. And it, but it's really important to understand that because what they have to then do, which most people don't understand, is they then have to sell those ideas into their own business. And this is always what I found was um, I'm fortunate enough to have worked with some of the world's best creative agencies and I, and I love it and I genuinely get a buzz from it. And I, and I like to think of myself as being reasonably creative as well. So I, <laughs> I sort of, I, it's, it's like the highlight of my week, you know, if I get a chance right. to do it. But then I have to remind them to say, I'm not the ultimate decision maker. I've got to go back and convince the CFO who's, you know, an accountant who mm. like, it doesn't get the crazy idea you've come up with. I've got to go and convince he or she that spending this money on this crazy idea is a good thing to do and or the sales director or the CEO and so on. Mm. And so one of the things I often say in the training I've done for CMOs is don't forget that everyone has a customer, that even mm. though your customer might be the CMO, that the CMO's got their own customers. And the more you can make the CMO look good and arm the CMO with the right data and the right arguments to kind of win the battle, then that'll really help. No, that's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. And I totally agree. I think we lose perspective on what their job is and the, the folks that are around them that they have to influence and, <laughs> yeah. and get on well, board as well. I'll tell you what, I'll tell you one, one little story actually relating to pitching is um, I got invited along to a, a conference about pitching uh, for agencies mm. and uh, there was a panel and I was the sort of representative customer, a representative kind of CMO on this panel. Mm. And the debate was whether agencies should refuse to pitch. And I've never seen a group of people get so angry in my life as, as they, they were like, <laughs> it's terrible that we have to pitch and the work that goes in and the, the damage to people and we don't get paid. And, and it was almost like they were taking the industry's frustration out on me. I felt like I was uh, alone in a room with a hundred you know, <laughs> agency people all kind of venting their frustration. And I, I, I thought, oh dear, how do I respond to this? And I said, look, all I can say is, is, is don't forget this. I've set my alarm for 4 a.m. tomorrow morning because I'm going to get in the car. I've got a five-hour drive to get to my number one <laughs> customer. And I'm pitching the customer myself to try and save the listing of my product in their stores. And <laughs> you know, my entire job depends on how well I can pitch tomorrow. So I get you. But don't forget that I also have to pitch, you know, so you know, help me <laughs> out. <laughs> I'm exactly. on your side. You know. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Well, let, let's talk a little bit about system one. What, tell us about the company. What, what do you guys do and what do you offer? Oh, it's, it, it's a really cool company. And, and as I say, I liked it so much I joined. System One was inspired. It's, it's, it's a 20 or so year old, originally a research company and mm. based on behavioral science and the understanding of why we buy what we buy and, and so on. And about five years ago, originally called Brain Juicer, actually, and then it, it mm. rebranded a System One. 
And it was inspired, the rebrand was inspired actually by Daniel Kahneman's book, Thinking Fast, Thinking Slow. And um, the idea that our decisions are actually made by our system one. So I think there's a, there's, there's a quote uh, from Rory Sutherland, I think is like, system one is like the uh, Oval Office and system one is, system two is like the press office. Um, <laughs> you know, we, we kind of like to, th- we like to post-rationalize things, don't we? We're very logical, yeah. but actually we make, you know, we, we make decisions based on the craziest things. Um, but the idea behind the business is that actually emotion predicts most of our behavior. And so what we do is we design simple questions about advertising or about innovation or about branding to ask people how they feel about it and, and why they feel how they do and, and, and what associations come to mind. And we put people under time pressure. So we elicit the first response that is usually the one that tells us what they do. So we've designed you know, very, very clever ways of asking questions. And then what we've done we've then turned it into a platform so that um, the idea being is that if you're a customer system one, you can upload an ad, you can upload a bit of innovation, you can upload a script or a test or a radio, anything you want really. And mm. then um, within a few hours, we can send it out to whoever you want, you can choose your target audience and we'll measure the emotional response. And what's so cool about it is um, we've got almost 100,000 ads on the database. So you can benchmark your bit of creative versus your competitors, versus Mm. the country norm, versus your audience norm. And um, the real benefit of it actually is that we've been able to validate that how people respond emotionally and predicts how they behave. And so we can actually give a a prediction of the likely impact on Mm. market share in the future. And going back to my kind of war story about LucasAid, it was the ability to show the emotional response to the campaign idea we created on LucasAid that allowed me to go to the exec team and convince them to invest the money in the campaign because I was able to predict that actually this campaign has got a higher a high chance of success. It's better than the average in the category. And if we spend the right enough money on it, then the prediction would be that we'd grow market share by half a percent. And that's exactly what we did. So part of the reason I was so kind of compelled by the business is I've experienced the power of the prediction. And the, the other thing it allows you to do, which is really cool, is, you know, those things we like, you're arguing with the agency about, I mean, I, I, I'll give you a real example, actually. So this, this yeah. campaign, we were, Energy Beats Everything, is a brilliant example, actually, because they'd landed the idea, the, the, the positioning, sorry, Energy Beats Everything was, I thought it was genius, absolutely spot on. It was based in product truth. It was true to the history of the brand. But they, it was such a good idea or such a good platform that they came up with seven completely different ways of executing it. And literally, <laughs> I've, I've never been in a meeting where I could have bought any one. I mean, it was, it was the craziest, <laughs> crazy meeting. But at the end of it, I'm looking at the team going, what the hell do we do? Because you're on fire. And like any one of those seven would be just unbelievable, right? And so we had to make a decision. And it's, again, an interesting lesson here because the idea that I thought was absolutely the winner because I had sort of fallen in love with it. I got mm. carried away with it in my head. I'd started to play with it. And to, I'd even started to pretend to act the voiceover for it, just as, you know, because <laughs> it was like, it was so good. It, yeah. I know, it, it kind of already stuck in my head. Yeah. After two hours, I was sort of like already on to season seven. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but, but what I learned actually in that moment, well, firstly, the testing is that I, you know, I said to the team, I tell you what, let's not make a decision between us. Let's send this out overnight to mm. the audience who we want to, you know, who want to buy this and let them decide. And I, I told them about system one and, and so they understood how it works. And when we got the results, it was fascinating. The idea that came top was the simplest idea. Of, and what, I, what yeah. I realized is as marketers, we are overexposed to our own products. Uh-huh. And most people don't think about our products nearly as much as we do. We're a very small part of their life. We don't have as much meaning as we think they should have and actually, the simple idea, the one that's most broadly, the one that was quickest to understand, won quite comfortably. So it's a great lesson. I mean, it's great. But, but the power system one was enabling us to get to that conclusion in 25 hours. I guarantee you, right? I mean, you know, you've been there. If, if, <laughs> if we hadn't had something like that, we would be months you know, kind of debating, well, I prefer this route. No, let's do that route. We'd, we'd have iterated the creative a few times. I'd have spent, I'd have spent lots of money. But this is a great way of deciding which was the right route. And the good thing as well, just to sort of add to it, was not only could I sell it into my business to get the money, I also was able to go to all my customers and go and say, not only is this campaign going to be the biggest spending campaign in the market for next year, it's also the one that I've demonstrated is creatively more powerful than any of the 
competitor campaigns mm. of this year. So it gave me a, and that the reason that's important, I mean, no, this is drinks, but the reason that's important is you win your ability to grow a, a, a drink brand. It, I mean, it's true for CPG, I know, is actually to grow your space in store. So more space you have in the fridge and, and on the shelves dip, typically dictates how successful you'll be. And by going in, I was able to go, this campaign will grow sales and therefore you need to put more shelf space over to my brand. Mm, I love it. I love it. Well, you've talked a lot about uh, just through those examples, like what works in advertising, but the emotional response is key. The simple, clear, straightforward, not overly engineered yeah. message. What is there anything else that comes to mind? I mean, you've got this huge wealth of uh, a database and benchmark. Um, just oh, curious if anything else comes to mind. Th- there is no, th- there's lots actually. The um, one of the things talking about going from client to agency side actually, <laughs> something I, something I really enjoy is how you can get into a topic in a way mm. that I couldn't before. So like I, my career has been a, I've been a complete generalist, right? So I've had to mm-hmm. do product launches and you know, manage factories or distribution or, you know, so you have to be good at a bit of everything, right? What I love about System 1 is I've, become, I've been able to become a little bit of a mini expert. I wouldn't say I'm the expert, but, you know, I've been able to learn so much about, you know, about a particular part of the marketing mix. And my colleague, Orlando Wood, wrote this, uh, he's written two books, actually, one called Lemon and one called Look Out. And what he did in his book is absolutely genius. He, he, he's looked at art history over many years, which sounds a bit weird, actually. You think, oh, what can we learn from art history? But actually, so much of art and culture is reflected in advertising. And he shows the trends over the oh. years about how art has changed and how it's influenced how advertising done. That's really interesting. But what he does, that's the stroke of genius, is he marries it with some neuroscience about how the, uh, it's based on this psychiatrist called Dr. Ian McGilchrist, who wrote a book called The Master and His Emissary. And it's basically about how the left hand and right hand side of our brain respond to the world around. They don't do different things, but they respond in different ways. And what he does is he actually broke down the very features in an advert and whether they trigger the left and right hand side. And he even took it as far as to go, he took a feature. So for example, the soundtrack, or there are characters acting in it, or there's a, there's a familiar mascot, or, you know, right. or, or there's a story that unfolds. So he broke it down like that. And then he actually measured how much attention those different elements created for the audience and which emotion they elicit. So it, it's an incredibly sort of scientific way of doing it. But it's a bit like somebody sort of suddenly revealing behind the curtain how, why some ads work and some ads don't. And once you see it behind the scenes, you go, oh, that's why that ad annoys me. That's why I remembered that one. That's why that one made me feel happy and that one made me feel sad. So it's an amazing, genuinely amazing, but I mean, I know I'm employed by the company, so I'm a bit biased, but it's, uh, I've never, you know, I've never come across anything that explains how advertising works in such a clever way before. And, but also it's not just that it's academically clever. It's also that it's very practical because he, he just, right. it, it shows you. So for example, I know this is going to sound obvious, but an ad that's got a melodic soundtrack rather mm. than a rhythmic soundtrack. So if you've got a rhythmic soundtrack, which a lot of, you know, a lot of ads do, it sort of puts you in a trance. Whereas if you've got music that's got melody, it sticks in your head. You know, you remember the melody, <laughs> it captures right. your attention. You know, it's, I mean, that's just one example, but he's got so many examples of the tactics you can use in advertising that make it work. So uh, thoroughly, I mean, if anyone listening wants to kind of get a, a world-class kind of lens through what makes ads work, then thoroughly recommend Orlando's work. But I, I quote him constantly whenever we're doing debriefs <laughs> with customers, honestly. I'm like, look, I'm merely the practitioner. I've made lots of ads. I've made good ones. I've made bad ones. But I can now tell you why the bad ones were bad and why the good ones were good. So uh, there you go. That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, I have to check it out. I haven't, I haven't read either of his books, so I'm, it's on my list now. So thank you. They're, 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 by the way, they're quite big and um, oh, yeah. they're, they're quite they're quite weighty, <laughs> uh, which, which is which is which is appropriate. But I can't remember that. Oh, let me try to think what the phrase he uses. He's quite self-deprecating. He said. <laughs> They're, they're such big books that when you put them down, you can't pick them up again. <laughs> <laughs> they're impossible to pick up again. Anyway, that's funny. But, yeah, that's yeah, funny. Well, um, I, you know, one of the things, I mean, you're a podcaster as well. You've got the podcast CMO Uncensored. You've interviewed a ton of people as well. Like what, what are some of the lessons that you've taken away from those conversations? Yeah. I, and, and I have to say it's a, uh, I mean, I, I love what you and I do because it's, you get to meet so many amazing people. Yes. Yes. Oh, it's, it's amazing. Isn't it? and, and what I, what really encourages me is people's generosity. Like you get, you get very, very famous people or 
successful people willing to share what they've experienced for a long time. So I love it. It gives me loads of energy. I mean, the things, and, and I thoroughly enjoy meeting CMOs and finding out how, how they get on. There are some surprising things, maybe not surprising things. I mean, one of the things that I, I experienced myself that I noticed in a lot of CMOs I meet is actually how lonely the job is because yes, yeah. it's interesting, isn't it? Because you get to a point where you suddenly realize you're the most senior marketer. You have to make the, the difficult decisions, you know, employment mm-hmm. and cutting budgets or whatever. But your team is now, is for the first time in your career, your team is no longer marketing. Your team is business, right? Your peer group are HR, factory, you know, finance, factory, see it and so on. So what I find that what makes a successful CMO is not what makes a successful marketer. And this is something that most people don't understand. And I call it the hidden P's. So, you know, we're, we're all kind of like, we're all well drilled now, aren't we? On the four P's, product, place, price, promotion, whatever. There are two P's for CMOs, which is politics and persuasion. But actually, I think you have to be very good at managing the organizational politics and you have to be very good at persuading people, whether it's investing in marketing, whether it's getting customers to buy into what you're going to do, whether it's kind of, you know, representing your team in the boardroom. But I, but I find the skill set that makes you good as a CMO is very different to the skill set that makes you good as a marketer up to that point. So that was a surprising thing. I think the um, another thing I learned is, I guess, short and long is that the interesting thing with the CMO role is that most people in business are focused on the short term, but actually the CMO probably more than any other role needs to take a long term view. And balancing those two things is very, very difficult. And I think it's because as a CMO, you can get sucked into, they say, decision making, crisis management, you know, mm-hmm. executional details. But if you're not looking long term, who is? I mean, because right. most other functions are running a factory or running a supply chain, running a sales team. They're all execution, whereas actually the CMO should be brand strategy, long-term brand value creation, long-term innovation, and, and so on. But so balancing short and long, I think, is really tricky. And then the other thing I'd probably say is the importance of people and culture. So anyone I've spoken to, any of the CMOs I've spoken to that have had great success, they're very, very quick to recognize the talent in their team. And they're also very quick to acknowledge that the role that culture played in creating the conditions for success. Mm. So I think a good CMO is not, and, and I, I say I got this a bit wrong, actually, because I remember when, when I got my job <laughs> you know, on the energy drink, I'd just come from a small business and I was it, it suddenly moved to a large business. And I thought my job was to answer the questions and, and do the do. And it was right. a bit weird where I went, oh, that's why I've got this massive team working for me, you know? <laughs> so, so, so my job is to train them. My job is to kind of give them freedom. My job is to kind of make sure they don't mess up and so on. So right. uh, actually a big, big learning for me is you're no longer doing the do and therefore you have to create the conditions for success. And that mm. means basically hiring good people and focusing on the culture and the ways of working that's going to unlock great potential in others. No, I love it. I, lo- I love all of those ideas and the, the takeaways that you have. The one on the short and long, another way that I've thought about similarly, I hadn't thought about in short and long, but that totally makes sense. But is if you think about the CMO and the C-suite, besides the CEO, they're probably the only two roles that are externally focused on the company. Everybody else is about squeezing operational efficiency, dialing in everything that the company, the machine is running, so to speak. And their focus is slightly different, right? The CEO is going to be more focused on the board or the shareholders if it's publicly traded. And the CMO is the customer, right? Like, or should 100%, be. yeah. Uh, and uh, so it, it creates this weird dynamic as well. It does. I and I mean, well, one of, the, one of the, uh, the quotes, so I think I was chatting, I think it was Mark Ritson that said this, but mm. the primary job of the CMO is to represent the customer where the decisions are being made. Yes. And that I thought was brilliant because look, that, that, Good CMOs will really understand their customer and be able to make the case for why, you know, why the business should invest in the right things, but do it based on good understanding of the customer. And we always joke that we always think we know what the customer's like, but there's nothing (laughs) like meeting the customer to realize they're rarely what we think they are. And I think it was Ehrenberg Bass actually did this study that basically found Mm. out that they, they got marketers to rate ads and, and whether they were oh, going to yeah. work, whether they yeah. worked or not. And they were only 50% right. In other words, right. <laughs> they were no better than anybody else at predicting advertising that works. And we overestimate our own ability and we underestimate our customers. 
And so I think the importance of, as Mark would say, market orientation. If the CMO doesn't understand the customer, then nobody else in the business is going to do that. So yeah, it's absolutely essential. I love it. Well, I, I want to switch gears. And um, uh, there's a series of questions I ask everyone that comes on the show. So you're no different. <laughs> <laughs> but, but my favorite my favorite question to lead off with is, has there been an experience of your past that defines and makes up who you are today? Oh, am I allowed to say two things? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Oh, because I, I, t- two things came to mind when you said that was... Um, I think it's funny how childhood experiences kind of really play out who you are. And, and it's actually yeah. my dad, bless him, that sort of occasionally reminds me of this. But sometimes, you know, you, you think, well, when did you know that you were going to be in marketing sort of thing? And, and, and I didn't sort of, I didn't discover marketing until after I'd done a finance degree. So arguably quite late. But then I look back and went, yeah, I was always a marketer, wasn't I? And uh, one of the things, um, my, my, my dad's in forestry. That's his profession. He's a professor of forestry. And um, he, owns a, he owns a wood, as, as, you, yeah, as you'd expect, right. sort of like, which is quite good. So he can carry on his passion in his, in his pastime. But when, when, I was a, you know, when I was a kind of growing up, I used to buy trees off my dad cut them down, cut them into firewood, put them in bags, and I'd walk around our village and I'd sell them for a 300% markup. <laughs> so I kind of like, I had all, I had the latest BMX or the latest skateboard or the, la- you know, the latest high fi whatever. <laughs> you know, and it was all based on you know, going to my dad, going, oh, I'll pay you a pound per whatever weight of wood it was. And then I'd sell it for three pounds. <laughs> so I remember that. So my dad always says, yeah, it's fairly obvious, you know, uh, you know, and, <laughs> So, anyway, so, I know I, I had an eye for marketing and, and, and a margin. I think more recently, the thing, I mean, I, I joke about it. I joke about you know, having been fired twice as a CMO right. and the fact that CMOs 10 years are, are usually only about 18 months. And you know, I haven't even made that. So I sort of joke about being fired, but that is quite a tough thing to go through, you know? And um, yeah. I realized, I, I think I realized how cutthroat big corporate life is and how the thing that I, I learned is how divorced perception and reality are. So my mm. experience has been you can actually in reality be doing an amazing job, but if internal perception isn't that, then right. it doesn't matter. You know what I mean? And equally, yeah. I've seen people that are actually overseeing complete and utter disasters, but somehow <laughs> they've repackaged it as a success. And I sit there scratching my head going, how is this possible? How can divorce, <laughs> you know, how can you divorce like what's really going on from what's, and managing the, this is why the hidden P's of persuasion and politics come in. And I don't know, but I, I, I would like to think that eventually the good guys win and the ones that are honest and uh, doing it for the right reasons <laughs> come out top. But my evidence for that is not very strong. So, um, but I, I think in terms <laughs> of like saying what shapes me, I, I, I'm someone who's quite transparent. I'm quite honest. I will always answer the question in the way that I think the right answer is I'll never do the political, the political option. And it's cost me. It really has cost mm, me, unfortunately, yeah. in my career. So maybe that's why I'm the uncensored CMO, because I've, I've decided <laughs> that I'm fed up being censored and having to tow the party line. No, I love it. I love it. And it is, I mean, those are for, formidable experiences. Formidable is my really wrong word, but like is, those are impressionable experiences on your past. I mean, it's happened to me too. I mean, it, it has it. Oh. it. Oh yeah. I think yeah. it happens to, I think it happens to everyone. <laughs> more, more, it, people don't talk about it, do they? Yeah. No, no. And I think if you're pushing it, pushing for the right things, but maybe you forget the persuasion or the politics part, yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, it'll catch up with you at some point. I think it does for a lot of people because at some level, the other thing that you mentioned, I mean, we talked about a little bit before was the loneliness of this job. Mm. And if you are one of those fighters, so to speak, you fight for your convictions, you can lose sight, you know, in the heat of the moment. <laughs> yes, uh, yes. Uh, and that can, can trip you up. But uh, it's, it's funny, cause I, I mean, it, this might be me repackaging my failure. But yeah. I often say to people, if you've not been fired, you've not tried hard enough. <laughs> well, there's I I kind of agree to, with that to a large extent. I mean, we can always you know push our agendas or persuade people a little bit better. But I agree. I think there's too much of what you described, which is people that are getting promoted for kind of lackluster or yeah. even to your point, like uh, disasters that somehow they've yeah. <laughs> packaged as a success. Yeah, it happens all the time. It happens all the time. 
unfortunately. It, I know, I know. We, we, I hope everyone listening to this podcast can take some encouragement that, that eventually the good guys will win. And well, the other thing, the other thing it does do actually, and, and to put the positive on it, yeah, I, I've never been so motivated and inspired and been at my most creative than after being fired because mm. it. You sort of you sort of get thrown into the situation that you had no control over, right? Mm -hmm. And then you're forced to go, what do I want to do with my life? And right. I've got to get I've got to get a job. I've got to go out and meet people. I've got to go and pitch myself. And it gives you motivation, energy. It takes you into into other paths that maybe you didn't expect. And you know, I, I wouldn't be podcasting had I not been fired. You know, and I've thoroughly loved it. And it's built a network for me that. I couldn't have dreamt of before. So right. yeah, it, some, sometimes I see people get fired and get destroyed and almost yeah. never work again. And they, it's almost like it's broken them. But I've seen people get fired and go, do you know what? Best thing ever. It, I'm working with people I like. I'm doing what I love. It's the mm -hmm. push I needed to get off my backside and invent something. So I, as with all things, you can look at it in two ways. And I'm one of those eternal optimists that like, <laughs> Whatever happens, I'm going to find the positive somehow, you know? <laughs> so. Oh, yeah. Yeah, me too. I mean, I, entrepreneur at heart. So it's always about the opportunity. Like it, it, it closed one door, but there's like 99 other doors that I can totally. open. Totally, <laughs> yeah. What, 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 what does it give you the freedom to do? Find that and then, you yeah. know, take advantage. Exactly. Well, I, on the heels of that, what advice would you give your younger self if you're starting this journey all over again? Oh, that's such a good question. I, I, I think two things. And actually, one I've learned from podcasting, which is the first of all, understands the uh, power of compounding. So mm. what I, I mean, a lot of, in marketing, a lot of jobs are, you know, as we know, 18 months, two years. And so what happens is you go through this constant cycle of learning a job, just about mastering it, and then moving to the next thing, which mm. is actually not very clever when you think about it. Because right. what I've noticed with podcasts, I'm, I think I'm coming up for four years now, is the compound effects. If you go, the time it took me to go from one download to 10,000 was way mm. longer than the time it took from 10,000 to 100,000, right? right? So it, the, the whole thing accelerates and you also get better. And so many more people listen now than listen to the first show, but I'm not personally 300 times better. I'm maybe a little bit better, but actually the compound effect of consistency, good quality content, refining what you do and learning and, and so on it is really quite powerful. So really the, the point of that is start early. If you want to do something, start early and learn from it and keep going at it. And what you'll find is the feedback loop will, will give you so much rich, rich information. And the other thing linked to that, right, is, is and you know this because you, you've been doing yeah. yours longer than me, is persistence, a consistency and persistence yes. really beats most people. So I can't remember now, but the average podcast has only done three episodes. Or I mean, there's a really right. silly statistic about that. And actually <laughs> just committing to something and sticking it out can pay off. So that would be the first thing. And then the second thing I wish I had done is, um, and this plays a bit to the psychology, I suppose, of me, is I never felt I was good enough. Uh, and I never felt I knew enough to mm. take the risk to do what I wanted to do. So I, I always had this, well, if I do one more job, or if I do get a bit more experience or I always had some sort of excuse to wait until I, I felt like I needed the entire answer before taking the leap. And actually, I think I've learned that you actually learn through taking the leap itself. Mm. And uh, I, I wish I had jumped into entrepreneurship or started my own business probably in my late 20s, early 30s, when I had maximum levels of energy, lower, mm. less commitment in terms mm -hmm. of houses and kids and stuff like that. So maybe I'll be one of those kind of like, 50 year old entrepreneurs that you know has a has a has a renaissance but yeah I, I, i'll start early and when you start don't give up because the compound effects will uh, really kick in for you uh, is there a topic either you're trying to learn more about today or you think marketers need to be learning more about that's a really good question and do you know what i, I yeah. thinking about thinking about that it, it it's really hard to because there are so many topics, kind of quote unquote. So you mm. might go artificial intelligence. You know, what's that going right. to do to marketing in the future? You, you know, you might go the metaverse. How do brands turn up in the metaverse? You might, you might go direct to consumer. Seems to the bubbles burst. Or whatever. There are so many fundamental changes to the, you know, to the mechanisms by which marketers operate in, and, and the channels and the platforms and so on. So any one of those could be significant. I think though. And I'm going to go back to a famous bit of work that looked at, I think it's data decisions, looked at the, what has the greatest impact on the outcome of campaigns. 
And number two was creativity. Number one was your brand size. So now you can't do anything about that. Your, the brand size is a consequence of what you've done in the past, right? Right. And so therefore, the second most important factor was creativity. And the reason I'm going to say creativity is I don't think the computer in my lifetime will ever truly replace <laughs> creativity. So I think if you can learn how to harness creativity for a business outcome, that will be the skill that keeps you employed in the future. So I think that, although that's a very generic, broad answer, I think we as marketers need to demonstrate the power of creativity to drive business performance. And the more we can do that, the, the more we keep ourselves in a job. Right. No, I, I love that idea. And in part, I was on a panel recently and there were, it was kind of around marketing effectiveness and measurement to a degree, but really effectiveness as a bigger topic. And I, as I was listening to everyone on the panel talk and they come from very respectable places, measurement houses and things like that. And there was a lot of model speak. And I made the comment, I said, one of the things that could make us even more effective than you know, chasing where the most effective number tells us to point our dollars or point our gun, so to speak, is what would break the model? You know, what could we do that would make the model null and void? Yeah, that's <laughs> because a good if you question. think about it, the, yeah. the, the model is based on history of what has been done, not what yeah. could be done. And I think that's where creativity comes into play. So I, I totally agree. And he's the most overused topical modern person about marketing. But Ryan Reynolds, there I said his name, is the first guy to write an ad with chat GPT. And he did it in a creative way, right? Like, yes, he had, yes. He, he, had it, he had the algorithm write the ad and then he kind of monologued it <laughs> and commented yeah. on how good it was. And yeah. th that in and of itself is taking something that could, people are fearful that will replace us all and putting a twist on it. Well, let me tell you what, one, one quick uh, system, one example actually of yeah. what you've just said. Do you remember the, uh, it was a few weeks ago now that Nike did a collaboration with Tiffany and they mm, launched yes. a, yeah, yeah, they, yeah. They launched yeah. the, the kind of color. It was, it was a black pair of black pair of sneakers uh, with a Tiffany colored swoosh on it. And initially there was like loads of positive response and there was huge kind of, you know, chat on online about it. I looked at it and went, I don't think it's that good. It, it feels a bit lazy. It's like, I would expect a little, you know, put some diamonds on there at least, you know, or, or do right. something that's like, is going to stand out and be a bit more bling. No, no, I'm not the consumer. So what do I know? Of course, mm -hmm. it's not designed for me. But um, at System One, we've got this uh, test your idea platform, which basically does the same thing for ideas and products as, as we do for advertising. Mm -hmm. So what's the emotional response? It's a really clever thing, actually, because what we ask people to do is not do they like it. We ask them, we, we get five different products and we ask them to invest as an investor in the one that they think is going to be most successful. Because again, going back to Daniel Kahneman, uh, ask the question of, would you invest your money is a better question than would you mm. buy? Because would you buy, most people would go yes or probably to most things. Would you invest in it actually, are, actually tells you whether or not you think it's a, it's a good idea. Anyway, that was the psychology of the methodology. But I put uh, an, an AI generated Tiffany and Nike trainer in against the actual <laughs> Tiffany Knight trader, right? It kicked its ass. So the give you <laughs> give me this give me the score. This is embarrassing for Nike, right? Give me the score. Yeah. So the um the original collab scored a 2.7 stars. The the rating goes up to 5.9 stars, right? As the you know 5.9 would be the best thing that's ever been launched. The artificial intelligence concept got to 5.0 star. Wow. Yeah. Now we chucked a few extra ones in for fun. We chucked an Adidas Gucci collaboration, which got 5.2. But if you, think about, if you think about it, the AI-generated Nike one that was done in a few minutes was able to match probably the best human-invented collaboration out there. Now, I looked at the results and went, do you know what? I think what they were doing is optimizing what's already out there. So I think your point right. is so spot on, is that if you want to optimize the best of what's there, then it's probably an insane tool. Or if you want to generate different ideas and then and then innovate off the back of them, I can see its role. So this is where I come back to the point about creativity. I think it's creativity that joins the dots. It comes up with what hasn't been thought before. Mm. And it's and that's why it's so important that that's what we develop the skill set for. I love it. Well, um, two more questions. Curious if there's brands, companies, or causes that you personally follow or you think other people should take notice of. The brands I'm impressed by, by at the moment, I have to put a little bit of a system one hat on, is actually Amazon. Yeah. 
And mm. I tell you, I tell you why, and it's a bit ironic. Do you remember Jeff Bezos did that quote years ago going, advertising is the penalty you pay for having an inferior right. product? Yes. It was like, yeah, it was, yes. you remember that? It's like, I, is it, I, I, I don't know whether he'd say that now. But I, I saw some data the other day that just made me laugh. And because I believe Amazon is the biggest advertiser in the US at the moment. So mm. it's quite ironic that, you know, Jeff Bezos <laughs> has gone from sort of like, it's all about products to it's all about brands. But the reason I'm a, I admire Amazon, apart from the fact they've, they've learned that, you know, products and brands need to be together. You can't just have an amazing product without a good brand. Is the fact that their advertising, and this is, where, this is where I'm fortunate to have the system on database, their advertising is so good. I mean, yeah. they, um, they, they came equal top on our ad of the year last year. They came top at Christmas. They come, you know, they do very, very good Super Bowl advertising. They don't, they really get it right. And they employ very, very good creative agencies to help them work. So I look at that as a business and there's a number of reasons why I like them. I think the, they've understood brand building, even though they're a technology platform. Mm -hmm. So they, they've understood both worlds, you know, both the kind of brand building kind of world and the product SaaS kind of world, which is amazing. Their products is if I think about how I behave now, I, I just <laughs> default to it. I mean, yeah, I anything. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, <laughs> I just go like, I think something and I just go to Amazon and go, oh, I went to the physio yesterday. She said, oh, you need a, sque you need a squeezy ball to improve the, you know, your finger function. And right. I, just, I didn't stop at a shop to get it. I just went, oh, Amazon, you know what I mean? So <laughs> something very niche like that. I go to Amazon, that, that, that's amazing. So I think they've, more than anybody else in the world, I think, have learned that make it easy for your customer Mm -hmm. It's like the biggest hack there is in life. And we're, we're all so busy that actually they've understood their customer probably better than anyone else on the planet. So I think for me, both a product point of view, the understand the customer and then a brand building point of view, for me as a brand, I'm just, I think what they're doing is amazing. No, I agree. I agree. They are everywhere. <laughs> yeah, so, I know. I know. Yeah. And, and, and I, I, you know, people have points of view on Tesla or Elon Musk and that sort of thing. Right, right. I don't. I, I mean, I, I've never met either of them. I'd love to. I don't, I don't think people have the same big debate about Jeff Bezos and Amazon, do they? I, I don't know why no. that is. Maybe he's just not on Twitter the whole time. But in, <laughs> so as a brand, yeah. you know, even, even Jeff himself seems to have kind of managed his brand, his personal brand well as well. Yeah, yeah. I think for the most part, for the most part, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, but yeah, anyway, last question for you. What do you think is the largest opportunity or threat facing marketers today? Well, I might be in danger of repeating myself a bit because mm, okay. I think at the moment, everyone is thinking AI is mm. a threat. Now, genuinely, having just given you an example of AI being amazing, I, with these things, you know, there are so many things that, you know, that sort of bubble up as, as NFTs or whatever, you know, suddenly mm -hmm. every marketer needs one. And then it's like, right. that was so last year. So I think with the threats is if you look across, you know, history of humanity, we, we've always dealt pretty well with the threat. So I'm, I know it's a bit of a vague response to your question, yeah. but I just wonder whether the threats are not as big as we think they are. But I think the threat that we're all worried about is AI, because I think the obvious thing is, mm -hmm. uh, can I mean, if you look at what AI can replace in marketing, it's pretty much damn well, most of yeah. it, right? right. You know, packaging yeah. design, consumer research, idea yeah. creation for your advert, what should you do next? How do you write a script? I don't know. But, but it, it does it all in an average way. So this goes back to my, this, sorry, this is why I am repeating myself now. This mm. comes back to the biggest opportunity, which is with, given that the tool set is getting better, the marketer has to be more of a generalist. Mm. And the opportunity for marketers is really to be business people first and foremost, to think, how do I create value for my company, yeah. for my brand? How do I use marketing to do that? And then how do I master the tool set, which is replacing the functional discipline of marketing but will never replace the leadership discipline of marketing. So I think that's the opportunity is like, so long as we don't like, don't become a, I don't know, don't, don't become an expert in a particular element of marketing that could easily be replaced by AI, go for more generalist skills. It's a bit like the, um, is it Daniel Pink's book about range? I, so I might mm. have misquoted, I might have misquoted who it is, but the one about range that in the future, it will be the generalists, not the specialists that win because it will be the people that connect the dots not make the dots that will uh, that will win out uh, ultimately. I love that. I love that idea. And I, it, actually, I was talking to a CMO yesterday, <laughs> and this notion of where you're kind of going is this new tool set that need to be business people first. I think we need to reset or reboot our marketing model a bit. And I, I hate to say like, 
I don't want to say it needs a new model because there's new everything every year, but like, I think there's a, a codification, a recodification of what marketing needs to accomplish and how. You're right. You're right. Um, I mean, this is what, this is why I love what Ritson's doing on his mini MBA. Because yes, I do he, too. He's, <laughs> he, he, yeah, because he, he start he he focuses on strategy and he starts with market orientation. What does the customer mm-hmm. want? What's your brand strategy? Because ultimately, the tools change and evolve. I mean, it's like the funny. You know, we, we always do talk about I'm a digital marketer. Well, digital is just one part of the tool set, right? It, it, it's like, you don't say I'm the point of sale marketer, I'm the PR right. marketer. You know, it's like, the <laughs> right. point is, as marketers, we apply the best tools to the job we got to do. But what Mark is doing as a big service to our industry is re- dragging marketing upstream to go, your job is to get the strategy right and then apply the right tools to the job. But don't, don't get sucked into execution all the time. Um, try and get your strategy sorted. So I think that's um, sort of a different way of saying my point really about generalists and leadership and starting with the business, you know, starting applying marketing to business solutions, uh, yeah. to, to business problems rather. I agree. And um, not to toot my own horn, but I'll do it now. I'll I go do, for it. Yeah, it's your I, show. I You're allowed to do well, this. <laughs> well, I, I have about, I think Mark could tell me otherwise, but I think it's somewhere between like six and 10 episodes that are appendium sources of his MBA course. Uh, oh, great. Brilliant. Um, but one of them yeah. is him, and it's an episode I'll link to, which is how to diagnose a brand. Um, yes, which yes, which is a big starting point for him. So uh, but, totally, um, and and, he, and he's he's very right. You see, if you diagnose your brand correctly, the the uh, it makes your life a lot easier <laughs> than, yes, if you, than if you don't. So yeah, always start there. And it's hard though, actually, because yeah. as a market as a new marketer taking over brands, your instinct is to get your hands dirty quickly. And the problem with that is you never get that time to go back up and reflect and go, what's the problem? What's the landscape? Why did my consumers buy? What am I trying to do? All that important questions. And you need to take time to do that. Hi, it's Alan again. Marketing Today was created and produced by me with post-production support from Sam Robertson. If you're new to Marketing Today, please feel free to write us a review on iTunes or your favorite listening platform. Don't forget to subscribe on marketingtodaypodcast.com. Tell your friends and colleagues about the show. I love hearing from listeners. You can contact me at marketingtodaypodcast.com. There you'll also find complete show notes and links to what was discussed in the episode today. And you can search our archives. I'm Alan Hart, and this is Marketing Today.